if not, I, I have a question. We, we, um, we do have a couple of questions in the um, in the chat. Okay, um, go with those. You'd like me to go with those. Um, somebody raised, and I think this is part of the, it was unclear if this is part of the Russian propaganda or if this is really true about the presence, a, a large Nazi presence in Ukraine. Um, is that something that you're aware of and that has that factors into this? Uh, the Russians have been uh, very uh, uh, much as uh, peddling the line that it's a Nazi government. And of course, you have to look at the fact that the president of Ukraine is Jewish. So it kind of it kind of doesn't doesn't make sense. Uh, you know, people kind of look at this. Well, you've got a Jewish president, and the Ukrainians elected him. Uh, I think uh, that does that doesn't fly in reality. I, I think part of the issue stems from the World War II days when the Nazis invaded uh, the area. There were uh, there were uh, some elements that collaborated with the Nazis. And not because they were pro-Nazi, but because they were trying to use the Nazis to fight against the Soviets. That the Ukrainians were stuck between a rock and a hard place. The Soviets were killing them from one side, the Nazis were the other. So it was trying to and, uh, fight one against the other type of situation. But uh, unfortunately, there were there were a number of atrocities uh, that were committed against the Jewish population, and that's uh, con uh, condemned by all. Uh, you know, and Ukraine has condemned all that. And, uh, but to say that the Nazis are in uh, Ukraine, uh, I think are, you know, I think that's not a legitimate argument. In any society, there are extremes of everything, even in our own society. Sure. But, to, but to color a whole society that way makes no sense. And particularly in the face that you have a Jewish president of Ukraine. And I might add one thing here. Uh, Zelensky has turned out to be an exceptional leader. Uh, those of you who have followed his background know that uh, he was um, a, a comedian, an actor. Mm -hmm. And I think he's actually used that background skillfully. He knows how to present himself very well. He also uh, uses the social media very well. And he's been able to motivate the Ukrainian people beyond their own self-motivation, which is already there. Uh, and I think he's been able to message uh, the international community. If anything, he's really a thorn in the side of Putin right now. <laughs> Um, there was another question about, um, well, a couple of questions. Two. Mm -hmm. One is, what, what should the U.S. do now, and how can the Allies get weapons into Ukraine? Mm. Um, what can the U.S. do right now? Uh, it's a very good question. I think what the United States can do right now is, uh, is uh, continue sending weapons into, into Ukraine. Uh, Prepare, help the Ukrainians prepare to fight now, but also to be able to sustain a um, um, counterinsurgency, uh, a uh, insurgency, I should say, against the uh, Russians. I think uh, another thing that I, I would do is I wouldn't disallow the possibility of some kind of uh, no-fly zone. Uh, I, I think it's important for the United States to go to the UN and get an endorsement from the UN. I know the Security Council won't be able to do anything because of the veto that the Russians and Russians have. But uh, I think it would be important to go to the General Assembly and get a, a resolution from the General Assembly calling for a humanitarian corridor. Uh, and I'm not sure we've got we've been using the UN effectively at this stage. Again, at least I haven't noticed it. I'm, I may be behind uh, behind the, the curve on this one. But I would try to use the leverage of the UN as a cover for humanitarian assistance. So when I say a no-fly zone, there's got to be a corridor that you got to open up. Uh, and it doesn't, uh, in Western Ukraine, Central Ukraine, so that humanitarian assistance can flow easily and that people can move out uh, easily. When I'm talking about no-fly zone, I'm not talking about a military one. Let me correct that. I'm talking, I should say humanitarian zone. Let's put it that way, uh, humanitarian zone. And I, I think we, we should uh, be uh, aiming to work with the UN to get that done. So military assistance, continue it. Um, we need to get the, the humanitarian corridors opened up. We should not just uh, let, leave this to the Ukrainians and Russians to negotiate. I think we should get the international community involved in this. And there's got to be some leverage through that. So those are two things that we can do. One, to sustain the Ukrainians in the battle and also to alleviate the, the suffering that's going on. 
Um, one of the questioners was asking more specifically about how to get the weapons into Ukraine. Like, what are the all the weapons? The there, there, there's, uh, there's, as I see right now, there's no problem getting the weapons in. There's mm -hmm. no problem. They're, they're flowing. Uh, you know, let's okay. let's put it that way. Uh, we'll leave it at that. They're flowing <laughs> into Ukraine. As a matter of fact, I think uh, uh, this is the situation that we face. Going back to what I talked about, us always uh, reacting to um, the Russians. This attack on Yavuri, where the uh, staging area was in NATO training and U.S. training, was, uh, I think, a deliberate uh, signal to to the West that uh, not to send weapons in or, you know, we are close, we're watching you, we'll hit any supply chains. Well, tough, <laughs> tough. We're going to send them in. And uh uh, I, we'll, keep, we'll keep sending them in. I, I don't have any doubts that we'll be, we'll be doing that. Uh, I wish we could give them the MiGs, though. That, that would be, uh, people say that the MiGs would not be of uh, great military value to the Ukrainians, but um, I, I'm not a military guy, so I'm not going to get into that because I don't know how, how, what the value would be for them militarily. But I tell you one thing to give them those MiGs would be a big shot in the arm in terms of morale, further boost morale that shows that the West is with them. So at a minimum, we need to do, find a way to get those MiGs in. But we've tied our hands with the flip-flop policy that we have with Poland on this one. And that's what's disturbing about our approach to this. Um, um, I'm gonna, I'll ask one of the other questions that's in the chat. Yeah. And then just to remind people, you can use the reactions tab and raise your hand and you can ask questions yourself. Um, there was a question about about currency and where the where the dollar um, whether that's under threat. Um, Our dollar? Whether Our the dollar as the current leading currency is under threat. Oh, I don't think so. Hey, uh, look, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm old fashioned. Uh, <laughs> people people say that China is going to be on the rise and etc. Uh, that the uh, Chinese uh, currency is going to challenge the U.S. currency. Uh, look, I'm old enough to remember the Japanese were going to overtake the world <laughs> back in the 80s and 90s, uh, if you recall. Uh, that uh, Japanese are, there were books and articles about the Japanese, you know, their economy. Well, it didn't <laughs> happen. Uh, I'm in the same boat uh, with uh, China. I think China is a big success story, irrespective of the politics. Let's put that aside. Mm -hmm. As a society and as an economy, China is a huge success. And it will continue growing. There's still room for growth there. But China has a lot of inherent problems, just like Russia. These guys may be challenging the international order, but their relationship will fray because they have their separate interests. Uh, but also their societies are going to fray. China has huge problems in terms of the older population, urban versus rural population, uh, sustaining economic growth, uh, the, the, the minority population, and the overall suppression of democracy and individual rights. That's a cauldron that's boiling, and they'll have their own problems. I cannot foresee, uh, and that kind of society cannot produce the kind of innovation for future growth. Uh, if you look at our society, we're such a mixture and a hodgepodge, but you look at our society, uh, this, this person is from this country and came here and developed this, this person from this country came and developed this, we're innovators. And that's what makes a society strong, uh, even though we don't realize it now because we're going through a lot of debates ourselves, it makes a society strong, it makes a society grow. I have no qualms that the American century is not over. We're, we're, we're stumbling right now, but that stumbling is mostly because of our own doing. Uh, once we get our act back together, and I have no doubts about it, uh, we're, we're going uh, to be uh, the country that everyone is going to look to. J just look at it now. <laughs> I hate to sound the, the, the old cliches. You see everybody working to get into the United States. <laughs> Nobody really to get out. You know, the old cliche. So, uh, yeah, I don't see the dollar. You know, we'll have ups and downs with the dollar, but to replace the dollar in the near future, I just don't think so. Okay. I'm sorry, that was a long-winded answer. No, no, these are great. These are great. Um, so somebody has a question about about pride and how much you you know you you referred before to 
um, you know, the, the history of Russia in mm -hmm. relation to Ukraine and that big brother thing, how much of this is about pride and a disrespect, well, Russians, you know, sort of dis disrespect and, and things like that as far as? Well, from the Russian side, it is in the sense that uh, going back to Putin and his view that Ukraine is not a country that was put together by various geographic re uh, regions and that they're not really a separate people from the Russians. And uh, one point I would point out is that uh, that eastern part of Ukraine, if you could do a mental picture of Ukraine for yourself, stretching from like south of Kharkiv or the Kharkiv area, a concave uh, curve along the border, then along the Sea of Azov, Crimea, and toward Odessa, that in the old days more or less uh, was called uh, Novorossiya, New Russia. So, mm -hmm. you know, so they see that as Russian lands historically, you know, and so there's a sense uh, when Putin says he's going into that, there's a sense of pride among Russians that they, this is their territory. I think I mentioned at the outset that like 58% of Russians, which is, you know, not, it's a majority, it's not a huge one, do favor the uh, actions against Ukraine. So there is a sense of uh, pride, I think, in uh, definitely in Putin and probably a lot of other people that they're regaining old territories type of stuff. But then again, there is pride on the Ukrainian side that they're fighting for their territory. Right. Yeah. How, how much of the Russian posi the, the position of the Russian people is affected by the um, you know by the clampdown on um, on the media? Uh, well, yeah, there's no doubt about it that uh, the storyline that the Russian people are getting is the one that Putin wants out, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, you know, they went, they're going into Ukraine because of the Nazis, uh, they're going into Ukraine because ethnic Russians are being, you know, discriminated against, they have to protect the ethnic Russians, all that, so there's no doubt about it that they um, get that storyline fed to them, but there are social media outlets throughout Russia and, and people uh, people understand this. Uh, but uh, irrespective of that, I think, you know, you know, I, I think there's a certain sense of in, a, in an authoritarian, authoritarian regime, obviously, you're not going to get the news cycle the way we do here. But I think that sense of authoritarianism that's existed in traditionally in Russia, and the, and the narrative under which Russians were raised about the views of Ukraine still holds to a certain extent throughout, throughout the pop, their population. It's, it's dissipated over the years, you know, as the society moves on, but I still think, think if uh, you scratch deep enough, it comes to the surface among uh, certain segments of the Russian population. Okay, let me turn it back to Robin. Robin, you had a question, there's, I don't, there's... Yeah, um, my question was, you know, we all saw back during the Trump impeach impeachment hearing, yeah. all of a sudden Ukraine was in the news, President Zelensky was in the news, and he found himself in the crosshairs of American election dirty tricks with mm -hmm. Trump trying to use Ukraine, Ukraine to discredit Joe and Hunter Biden. Do you think that contributed to Putin's calculations that Ukraine would be easy picking because of the weakened U.S. Ukraine? Ukraine relationship? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. I wouldn't say that that particular thing, I think uh, Putin as an OKGB operative, uh, Robin, it took measure of not only the people that led our country, but took measure of the society in general. And we yeah. uh, as a people over the last four or five years have gone through a lot of struggle and growth on various issues, on gender, on race, on politics, we've been split. Uh, and he saw, I think Putin read that as a sign of weakness that would give him an opportunity to carry out activities like he's doing now because the society itself was so fractured in a certain mm -hmm. way. And I think, I'm not saying that was the reason for it, uh, but I think that was a, one of the, Things he took into consideration. Part and the of the point, yeah, yeah, and the part, the point that you make about the impeachment hearings in Ukraine fed into that narrative that everybody's so split up. Here they were impeaching a president because of this. Uh, the Democrats are at the Republicans' throats, and vice versa. And uh, there's racial 
uh, uh, animosities brewing in the country and, and uh, you know, their uh, gender uh, issues that the, the country's, you know, falling apart and everything. Oh, well, I have news for you. If you look at our history, Robin, you know that we've wrestled with these kinds of things many, many times. Uh, all, uh, the, all the time. <laughs> yeah, right. We always come through them. We always come through them as a, as a people and we get stronger each time. So I, th I think he miscalculated to a great extent of, on things like this. I think he misread our society. I think he read it correctly in the sense that we had a lot of issues and still do, but whether those issues will give us a lot of weakness over time, I think he's misread it. Um, we uh, entered this war, as I mentioned to you, uh, unsure what we're gonna react and it's been obvious by our policy that one day we're doing this and we on the MIG and the next day we're doing this. In, this, in the approach to the sanctions has been kind of you know, drips and drabs. But we, we finally get to the point where we do the right thing. And I expect we'll do the right thing here eventually. Yeah, thanks. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, do, we have, do we have time for more? Yeah, yeah I'm happy. We, we have, okay. I, I enjoy this. Yeah, <laughs> there, there's time for a couple more, I think. Yeah, there was another question in the, in the chat about, um, about boots on the ground. Mm. And whether or not we're sort of this current position is sort of analogous to World War II, where you know, we sort of wait, you know, there was a kind of waiting until we got actively drawn in. Um, you know, why not boots on the ground? Why not? Why not get involved in that way? Uh, a very, very good question. I don't have the answer for it other than the following, and it has nothing to do with. Um, issues of uh, NATO or anything like that. I think we have to realize as a peoples that um, right now, Ukrainians are doing a fairly good job on their own in terms of fighting. Um, on the issue of, and we should continue supporting them in terms of giving the military equipment, as I mentioned to you. Uh, they themselves have not asked for any kind of assistance other than trying to institute a no-fly zone. And I made reference to getting a no-fly zone for humanitarian reasons already. And I think that, um, so uh, wh whether or not the United States, uh, so right now I don't foresee any real reason for the United States to consider boots on the ground. The humanitarian issues I think can be resolved not resolved, but can be tackled through the UN, as I mentioned, if we got the UN involved in this. Nobody wants to see this war to be extended beyond what it is right now. I'm a firm believer it can be contained in the area where, where it is being fought now. And it can be contained when, without any uh, US in, involvement in terms of boots on the ground. Now, having said that though, Judy, uh, there are all kinds of things that can be done. Uh, you can definitely call for volunteers to go into the country. And there are volunteers going into the country. Uh, you yourself know from history, there have been international brigades that have gone into conflict areas to support the government one side or the other. There's really no reason why that can't be done now. And we can, and we can even endorse that. I mean, the Russians themselves are talking about bringing 16,000 Syrians in. They've opened, I could drive a, attract the trailer through that door, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so you can, so there are, there are things we could do if we were innovative in terms of our approach, in terms of the type of weapons we supply, in terms of the international role, informal international role, in terms of the international community via the, the UN, the General Assembly specifically, endorsing certain activities. Um, the UN could even endorse, and I'm going out on limit, the UN could even endorse the formation of international brigades. You know, And what you need to do, what people I think are afraid to do is to challenge Putin on this because that would be viewed as creating, uh, provoking him and therefore he'll react in an irrational way. And you realize he's already spoken about the possibility of introducing tactical nuclear weapons. Well, you know, if you go by that logic, uh, any country with a nuclear weapon can go do whatever they want. Says, well, if you just if you oppose me, I'll I'll nuke you. Uh, and that in itself gives motivations to countries to 
develop a nuclear weapon, so they could all be in a position that way. Mm -hmm. So this makes no sense. Uh, and it makes no sense, uh, I think, you know, nobody really wants to test that, but it comes to a point in time where a country and a group of countries have to make some forward-leaning decisions. You can't be reactive all the time. And I think calling, uh, and I wouldn't say calling is bluff, but up in the ante to Putin, is it's the time has long passed and we can up the ante in the various ways I just mentioned uh, without putting US boots on the ground uh, in, a, in a formal way, but by having international brigades and supporting those brigades. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one more question, Judy. Yeah, I'd be happy to take the question, but I just remembered, I think I spoke about the Chinese uh, BRI, uh, I, I, I misnamed, I think it's the Belt and Road Initiative. So yeah. Yeah, I, I might've said the Yellow Brick Road or something. <laughs> but it's the, but it's the we Belt and we Road forgive you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. It's been a long day. A long I know, day. I know. <laughs> Mary, did you, want to, did you have a, a question from the chat that you wanted to, to share? If I can unmute myself, let's see. Um, from the chat is, what is your thought on whether Putin will continue into Poland after seizing Ukraine? Well, there's an assumption that, that A, he's gonna seize Ukraine and B, that he will go to Poland, but okay. Let, let, let. It's, it's, all, it's always difficult to deal with hypotheticals, but Mary, I would have to say this, that uh, Poland is not the next in line. If any country is next in line, it's Moldova. Uh, Moldova was much smaller, uh, and Moldova already has Russian troops stationed there. When they became independent with the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, there was a breakaway region called Transnistria in uh, Moldova where the Russian troops uh, remain to this day. So they're already pre-positioned uh, and Moldova is a small country. So uh, I would say Moldova better watch out if, uh, if uh, Ukraine falls. But I think Ukraine's gonna hold up. Ukraine's gonna do a lot better than people realize, I think Putin's in real trouble here. And I think Putin, at, uh, there's no off-ramp that we can offer him. The off-ramp, he's gonna have to divide his own off-ramp in this situation. And he might have to come to the conclusion that it's worthy to declare victory and leave and keep the Eastern half in, of Ukraine. As I mentioned, you know, what the concept of the new Russia, Nova Russia, holding on so bad. Basically, you have a, a larger chunk of Ukraine under Russian control and, and a continued frozen conflict type of situation. So uh, that that's probably his best off ramp. So I just don't think he's going to take over the whole country. But you know, uh, that and two dollars gets me on the metro. You know, so. <laughs> not even. <laughs> or, is it, or, is it four, or is it four dollars now? I haven't been on the metro for a while. <laughs> Well, Roman, thank you so, so very much. Sorry, Judy, were you gonna say something else? Yes. No, I mean, I think we could have this, con this conversation and cont continue. And in fact, I was gonna, I'm, I'm hoping maybe you'll come back sometime. Um, no, I'd love to, I'd love to. I hope you about. found this useful. Uh, I hope I wasn't too rambling. Uh, I, I've been drinking coffee all day here to stay awake, <laughs> you know, uh, but I enjoyed this immensely. Uh, and I wish uh, everyone there all the best. They have a good evening and everything. Thanks for having me. And Robin, thank you. Well, thank you very much for reaching out and getting this started. And Judy, to you for organizing it all. Mary, thanks for, uh, thanks you know, so uh, thanks for the, um, you know, also for your role in getting this organized. I appreciate it all. And thanks for taking so the much. time. I know you no, must no, my so, pleasure. so busy. My pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah. You take care, ladies. I'm getting Are you looking at the have, chat, Roman? There's lots of thank yous coming through. In uh, fact, if people uh, want to you. unmute, you can unmute yourself and, and say a thank you. <laughs> thank you very thank much. You. No, no, thank, thank you. you very thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Uh, you have a good evening. Enjoy yourself. Stay okay. Well. Thank okay. you. Have